Yesterday, we discussed the, um, the general quantum decomposition of a classical random variable with moments of uh, any order. Today, I want to apply this to the simplest case of the Bernoulli random variable. And you will see that so this will be extremely elementary talk. There will be a lot of computation, but I will jump the computation because I think everybody can do by himself. And, or, and, um, but there is some uh, thing which I want to um, stress, namely the probabilistic and physical meaning of a lot of parameters some of which are known, some of which are not so much known. In particular, the Q parameter. Now, <laughs> this is the QQ bit. The, the QQ bit will arise uh, canonically. It's not to be confused with the QQ clock, Swiss clock. But uh, in, in, for, in quantum information, they use the Q bit. But we see that from the theory of orthogonal polynomial, we, the natural object to study is not the qubit, but the qqubit. And I will explain why. So, what we want to do, first of all, is define random, what is a Bernoulli random variable. Bernoulli random variable is the simplest possible random variable. It is a, a real valued random variable with two values. We suppose that is not constant, so with probability one they are different. And we call these values x minus x plus. For example, in, a, in economy this uh, space is very important. x minus re represents a loss and x plus a gain. And uh, this is the typical risk scheme, the Bernoulli scheme. Bernoulli scheme is a universal object for probability. But, in fact, it is universal also for physics, if you think of spin one half. And you will see now how we will deduce the formalism of spin one half from orthogonal polynomials. So the probability of the event plus, of the value plus, is p, and the value minus is 1 minus p. And you will see that the full scheme, uh, what um, in economics, I, I, I teach economics in Rome, and uh, usually I define a risk scheme exactly like a Bernoulli process, like this. Uh, it is uh, in physics. Um, up to now, the standard spin one half theory takes into consideration this p. But we will see that, and it's very naturally, uh, from the point of view of physical and probabilistic interpretation, that all these three values will be very, will play important role. So let us, uh, so, to connect with the talk of yesterday, in which we were speaking of a measure of the real line, the measure of the real line that we are considering is now the convex combination of two delta measures. So we have a Bernoulli process characterized by these three parameters. The values x plus with probability p, x minus with probability 1 minus p. So the first thing we want to do is to deduce the Jacobi relations for these random variables, for Bernoulli random variables. Uh, for this, we will introduce the mean value. The mean value, of course, is this one very well known. The second moment is then the square. Remember, 
x plus x minus are real numbers, arbitrary real numbers at the moment. And therefore, we compute the variance, which is this. And this is very well known. And now we have the first theorem. Remember yesterday we have distinguished the monic Jacobi relation from the symmetric <laughs> Jacobi relation. I will begin with the monic one. Monic means that the highest uh, degree in the polynomial has a coefficient 1. But in this case the delta measure is uh, supported in two points. And there is a general theory, very well known in the te theory of orthogonal polynomial, that if a probability measure has a support in n points, the corresponding L2 space, obviously, is isomorphic to Cn. In our case, the, vector, the L2 space is isomorphic to C2, and so I have one orthonormal basis. According to the Three, di three, diagonal, the three diagonal Jacobi relation in this case is extremely simple. If, remember, phi zero is the, cons is the identity function corresponding to the vector with one and one. So, x multiplied by phi zero is, the polynom is a polynomial of degree one that we will uh, write uh, phi one. This is um, a misprint in the following. I will use this notation. Uh, and I will explain. So phi 1 here and phi 1 here, like phi 0. I, I did not correct this p. So uh, this is the polynomial of first order. This should be of second order. But since we are in a two-dimensional space, the polynomial of second order is a linear combination of polynomial first order. Uh, because we are now quotienting. Yesterday we did the not quotient for the zero measure, but now we are quotienting. So we have this second Jacobi relation. What is this M tilde? M tilde is a very interesting object. And I will describe in a moment. Intuitively, I anticipate that you see, if you take the mean value, you remember the mean value. of the Jacobi uh, of the Bernoulli process is x plus p plus x minus 1 minus p. But if you do the standard three diagonal Jacobi procedure, it canonically appears a kind of index which flips the values. You see, this is uh, like mp, but of an observable with the flipped values, x plus s minus. So what are the orthogonal polynomials, the monic orthogonal polynomial? The monic orthogonal polynomial are, um, you see, uh, this is my notation. If uh, I don't put up 0, I refer to the monic polynomial. So if I put up 0, means monic. Without up 0, it means normalized with the norm 1. Of course, the identity is both monic and normalized. But the first polynomial is not is monic, but not normalized. If we want to normalize, we must divide by the square root of the covariance, which is this one. Remember, mp is the mean, and this is the, vari the, the modulus this, of this, the, the, the positive covariance. Uh, the positive square root of covariance. OK, uh, the proof is very simple. You simply <coughs> know this uh, I just uh, outlined. You subtract to the uh, multiplication to the x monomial its component on the identity monomial. And then you obtain it. it uh, this is completely general. This is true for every probability measure on the real line, not specific of, of, the, of the Bernoulli measure. Now, if you compute the norm of the monic polynomial of first degree, you find the variance. And therefore, 
you have the this basis is orthogonal but not orthonormal and this basis is orthonormal using this basis we will identify our space uh, it's important to, the, to be precise in the identification because the identification determines the matrix and we will see the matrices will of course depend on the orthonormal basis that or also of the orthogonal basis that you choose. You will see in the following. So, we choose this identification. A function is identified to a vector with this order. This is opposite of a physics. Unfortunately, it came so, because usually in physics the ground state is down. And here is up. But, so, the uh, the scalar product is the one defined by the P1 minus P measure and the representation of the position operator in this case is simply the diagonal matrix but is diagonal in this basis you will see it not, will not be diagonal in the monic basis and the phi zero is simply the sum of the two vectors of the basis So, to have an idea of our vectors in the 2 by 2 representation, the first orthogonal polynomial corresponds to the subtraction of the mean to the standard vector. If we multiply the first orthogonal polynomial by x, we get this expression and then we look for solution of the system to obtain the, the we know a priori that since the L2 space is dimension 2 this must be a linear combination of these vectors so the unknowns are A and B we solve this system and we find the solution and from the solution of this system the flipped mean comes in okay the flip term mean will play a role in the definition of the Q parameter. So this is the proof of the theorem. I don't uh, give you the calculation. The meaning, you see, <coughs> of the flipped mean, as you can easily understand, will be in terms of the flipped random variable. So you, you define the flip operator, which permutes the basis E1, E2, in this permuted operator, uh, when you apply, uh, you can define the permuted random variable. And the permuted random variable is such that its mean value is the one that we found by orthogonalization. Now, let us come to the main point. What is the quantum decomposition of the uh, Bernoulli random variable? Quantum decomposition is a meaning with respect to the basis and we take it in the monic basis. You see, very, it's important. I underline because if you look at this matrix, you know that the position operator is symmetric. But in this matrix, it doesn't look like symmetric. Be and this happens because uh, uh, we, are, uh, 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 we are taking the matrix with respect to a basis which is ortho orthogonal but not orthonormal. Okay, so this is to prevent a uh, perplexity. So, what is the creation operator? You know that in physics is very well known the analogy. There is a whole book uh, devoted to the analogy between spin and creation annihilation. And in some sense, spin is a, a kind of a discrete approximation, in, in a sense that can be made very, very rigorous. This was an old theorem that we proved with Bach in 1974 and has to do with central quantum central limit theorems. <laughs> I will go on this in the next lectures. How, how these, objects are the these objects are important because they are the building blocks for the limit theorems. And the limit theorems will be in two stages. The first stage is analogous to classical probability. In the first stage you have limit theorem for random variables. So 
in the standard limit theorem for London variable, you get Gaussian. The analog of Gaussian is harmonic oscillator for boson and Fermi oscillator for Fermi. And we will get this step. The second step is the so-called functional central limit theorem, in which you introduce continuous time. And then you get, in the case of uh, uh, when in the one day man in the um, in the in the first step at level of random variable you get Gaussian, the corresponding functional central limit theorem will give you boson uh, will give you a st classical Brownian motion. In the quantum case, we will get quantum Brownian motion. If you get Fermi, you will get Fermi Brownian motion, and so on. Okay, so this will be the program of the future lectures. But at the moment, let us concentrate on this uh, uh, fundamental object, which is the building block, the two by the Bernoulli case. So this is the decomposition. The, this is the quantum decomposition. And what are the operators? I will show you them here. You see, the preservation operator is diagonal and, and Hermitian, as it must be. We know from the general theory, it must be Hermitian. The annihilation is typically a multiple of the uh, standard annihilation operator. Remember, we have uh, the inversion here, that uh, the ground state is the, the upper one, not the lower one. And uh, uh, creation, of course, is uh, adjoint. You see, here adjo uh, this factor is uh, because the basis is not orthonormal. Okay? So these are creation and inclination and preservation, the cup operators. Uh, the adjoint of X in this matrix form looks like this. Uh, the proof, I, I just, the proof is simply this. It's just the Jacobi relation. From the Jacobi relation, you obtain the matrix of X, which is MP and 1, and Vp, and m tilde p. So the, essentially this is the idea of the proof, nothing more than that. Okay. Now we come to the origin, probably what I promised, the main topic of this lecture. What is the origin of the Q deformation parameter? So we have, remember that the, the quantum decomposition of the Bernoulli random variable is this matrix. Now, the variance is always different from zero. And we want to look for canonical forms of this matrix. So what can vary are the mean, the flipped mean, are the only possible parameters that vary. So you understand that correspondingly we will have three canonical forms. The three canonical form will correspond to the mean zero, flipped mean, but all, in fact we will have all zero. You remember the, the Favard lemma, the, the symmetric probability measures are characterized by the fact that in their quantum decomposition the preservation operator is identically zero. Okay? So the symmetric measures will be characterized by both zero. The, the, um, then we can have MP zero but M tilde P not zero and conversely MP not zero and M tilde P zero. And the generic case will be when both are not zero. So let us see what is the canonical form correspondingly. So we have three canonical forms corresponding to the intuitive idea I tried to describe to you before. So what is the, the first canonical form? I must have the mean zero and the flipped mean equal to zero. And we will show that this is possible if and only if the Values are opposite and P is one half. So pay attention. 
in some sense this case is the highest level of symmetry for the random variable x because we have a symmetry of the two values with respect to the origin and symmetry of the probability both so in this case the variance you see this will be one fourth and the variance will be twice so square will be four and this will be the value of x plus I am not requiring x plus to be positive so we have the quantum decomposition in this case the quantum decomposition is the creation operator and the annihilation operator of course a0 is equal to 0 so we have this this is the quantum decomposition and you see it depends not it does not depend on the probability this is very important only on the values of the observable the second case is when a the preservation operator has rank 1 of course as we said before this can happen because the upper is diff uh, the flipped mean is different from 0 and the mean is 0 or conversely if the flipped mean is different from 0 then the preservation operator is this form and therefore this is the quantum decomposition x as this matrix rank 1 the rank one, uh, rank 1 is this, not, uh, not x. x is full rank. And in the case, well, if it is full rank or not, x will depend on the values of x. We will see in the uh, x plus s minus. And the second case, uh, we have the opposite. The flipped mean 0 in the, and the standard mean not 0. So the preservation operator is upper diagonal and and this is the quantum decomposition okay now the most interesting case the generic case when a0 is non singular when a0 is non singular you see that the preservation operator is the mean value of the random variable times a diagonal matrix where a Q parameter appears. This Q parameter is nothing but the quotient of the two means. Pay attention, the third canonical form supposes that both are zero. So this is a constraint on the random variable that admit such a canonical form. As you see, the Q parameters is a very... I, I don't want to give... The, the proof is computational, it's uh, easy. But important point, conceptually, is the meaning of the Q parameter. Because, uh, because you see, in physics, they have introduced Q deformations of the commutation relations. Uh, here we are introducing, in some sense, Q deformation of the anti-commutation relation. And then we will deduce the commutation relation as a limit. But we begin with the anti-commutation relation. And the Q deformation is a very, very interesting physical and probabilistic meaning. It is an index of asymmetry. You see, a global index of asymmetry. You will see in a moment, when we do some uh, examples, uh, we, you will understand, but intuitively you see that the, it, it, the, the, this expression tells you essentially how the mean value uh, of the, the boson case Q equal 1 corresponds to the flipped mean equal to the mean. Okay, because of this condition we are excluding q equals 0, which is very important because it's free, free probability. But q equals 0 is in the previous two canonical forms. 
Okay? Now, okay. So the general form of the um, of the parameter here will be this. Uh, oh, there is a multiple here missing, but uh, I mean this is general structure. It's up to a multiple is correct. Uh, just the case I want just to prove the case of the uh, first mean zero because the proof will give you an indication of the range of Q I have told you that this quotient can come but I I did not tell what is the possible what is the allowed range for this Q okay so, to have an idea of the allowed range is useful to have a look at the main idea of the proof, which is extremely simple. You see, the proof is that I have to have mean zero and the flipped mean zero. So, if I add these uh, two observable, if it is two equations, I obtain this equation, and uh, this, the probability adds up to one, so I obtain this equation, and this gives me the symmetry of the values. Uh, symmetry with respect to the origin. From the symmetry with respect to the origin plus min zero, we obtain that the only possibility is the, the p equal one half. And the remaining cases are dealt uh, with very similarly. So now we want to discuss this problem. What is the allowed range of Q? Let me tell you, this problem has a, a, a story in quantum probability. Because, you know, the Q deformation was introduced in physics without very, very detailed mathematical analysis. The first detailed mathematical analysis was done by Bozeko and Spiker. And they, and they proved uh, positivity for Q between uh, 0 and 1. Um, sorry, minus one and one, but real. Uh, mm, many, s s about a uh, few years later, about three, four, four years later, f studying quantum electrodynamics without dipole approximation with Sergei Kozirev, we discovered a very, uh, very interesting phenomenon that, in my opinion, will deserve some study. The phenomenon is the following. Take the standard non-relativistic quantum electrodynamics. That is, you have an atom or an electron interacting with uh, the electromagnetic field. But without dipole, so you keep a very strong nonlinearity. Then you solve the Schrodinger equation. You st uh, with respect to the atom as the, a free Hamiltonian which is just uh, Laplacian, kinetic energy, without potential. If you let evolve the atom with a coupled evolution given by standard quantum electrodynamics, you discover a very fascinating thing. At any time t strictly greater than zero, the original atom uh, observable, Q and P, which satisfy the Heisenberg commutation relation, at when they become QT and PT, they satisfy Q deformed commutation relation, but in the module sense. So it's a double generalization, not only Q deformed, but module Q deformed. This deformation depends on the interaction parameter lambda, the Q depends on lambda, and in the distribution sense, Q is an operator, so it's a kernel of an operator. In the distribution sense, this kernel goes to zero. So, in the limit you get free, free diagrams, not free probability. It's a mm, very nonlinear deformation. So, there was another Q deformation, which I, I told you this because I am, I'm not sure I will have time to, mm, to show you this result. This is an interesting one, but it takes a little bit more time. And uh, uh, 
I told you because in this, in this paper, the limitation of Bozego Spiker were not. The Q was complex. And uh, there and was no bound between minus 1 and 1. And, and we know that, that what we obtain is positive definite in the module sense because it's constructive. It is an automorphism. So the result is still something which gives you a, a, a product which is positive definite. So the problem is how can we fix mathematically? So since this is a different approach to Q deformation, it deduces from elementary basic principle, I uh, thought that it could throw some light and to investigate what is the possible allowed range for Q. Q now, you see, we want to answer the following question. We have this form for Q. And you rewrite like this. If you are in some experience of elementary probability, you recognize this factor. It's very famous in game theory, in the theory of gambles. This is called the stake. If you remember, this, is the, this is corresponds to a bet in which you lose x minus gain x plus with probability p. And uh, in the jargon of uh, betting, this is called the stake of the bet. So you see that the stake of the bet plays an important role. And the, you see, in the extreme case, the first extreme case is when you have a fair bet. But, uh, not, you have a symmetric bet, because fair depends on x plus x minus. You, we will see later on. But you have a symmetric bet. If the bet is symmetric, you remember, this cannot be zero. Because we are assuming that the mean is different from zero. So, you see, if the mean is symmetric, this quotient, which is the value of Q, can only be 1. So the boson case will correspond to the case P1 half. No other Q is possible. <laughs> and conversely, if a random variable has P equal 1 half, then this is the only possibility. What are the other possibilities? Let us see two other extreme cases. Let us consider the extreme case in which one of the two values is 0. So the x minus is 0. Remember, x plus can be either positive or negative. However, x plus must be different because of our assumption. The, the random variable is not constant. In this case, you see, what becomes Q? Again, Q, the only possible value of Q is the stake. You see, one, one, 1 minus P over P is just 1 over, one over P minus 1, the stake. And this is the only possible value if you have one of the two equal to zero. Similarly, if you have the other value, x plus equal to zero, you have this quotient, x plus will be this one equal to zero, you obtain this, and you find the inverse of the stake. So let us consider the generic case for Q. In the generic case, we have both x plus and minus are 0. Then you do some simple calculation. And you find that the quotient must be equal to this expression. But our assumption is that uh, we have uh, that x minus and x plus are both non-zero. So this excludes the possibility that this numerator is zero or that this numerator is zero. And this means that there are two values of Q which are excluded in this situation, which is the state. Of course, if I want to fix the probability, if we allow also the probability to vary, to vary the we will see that uh, this is uh, not excluded because for this probability is excluded, not for other values of the probability.
there is another condition, but this uh, is automatically satisfied. You see, this condition that uh, the mean and the flipped mean are different from zero is compatible with this value of Q. I will not do the computation because I'm afraid I'm a little bit late. So, the, the crucial point is that, uh, is that at the end we have this value of Q expressed in terms of the probability and, or in the generic case, these are both different from zero, of the quotient. So you see from this value immediately that if I vary in all possible way P X and this quotient, it only depends on the quotient, then I can obtain any real value of Q. Not only minus one and one. Now let us go to the commutation relations. You see, here is something uh, very interesting that uh, I have no... You see, is, uh, fermions are very well studied. There is a huge literature. However, while in... Uh, from... I think that the real... Uh, in, in physics in general, you, we are accustomed to give the commutation relation in terms of Heisenberg objects. And... Uh, in terms of a plus and a minus. I think with the hudson pertasarati calculus uh, was the first time where it was pointed out that this is much more natural. But in still in this particular form, and we know from the theory of orthogonal polynomial that the analog of this operator is what we have called A0. So this triple is very natural. Is the really, the generalized fields are, and now and we know from probability what is the meaning of A0. A0 measures the asymmetry of the random variable. Okay? The physical meaning is asymmetry. So it's very important. And now, why? In the boson case, we know very well because we use this decomposition of A0, which is very special of boson case. So we know that A dagger A commutator with A dagger is A dagger. But I don't, I have not seen in the literature the analog of this relation for Fermi. Because you see, from orthogonal, the theory of orthogonal polynomial, we have relations that I will, uh, I don't remember if I could uh, show you yesterday, but we will show. There are, there are some, some explicit relations depending on the probability measure. Okay? But what is the analog for Fermi of this? And now I think uh, from the Bernoulli decomposition, the quantum decomposition of Bernoulli will answer this. And you will see that the answer is non-trivial. So, uh, the quantum decomposition, by the way, gives much more than the Lie algebra relations. Because, you see, this commutator typically is of this form. But if you remember the, the talk yesterday, we have the possibility to calculate separately these products. So we obtain the Lie algebra as a corollary. But why only Lie algebra? We will see that there are other possibilities. In fact, anti-commutation relations do not correspond to Lie algebra. It's a different thing. Like can say Jordan algebra. So let us compute the, this is a list of things. What, what I want to say is that this is very important. This is uh, the root of this analog that I mentioned for Fermi. And you see it's very similar to the Bose case. That the product of a0a 
is a multiple of a, a zero edaga is a multiple of edaga. In this case, it's the flipped mean. And if you take a daga, a zero, is the mean. This gives you, as a corollary, the commutation <coughs> relation. Then you have a, n minus uh, is uh, the, the projection um, in matrix terms. This is a standard notation in quantum mechanics, n minus will correspond I think uh, remember that we have a we have the inverted uh, notation with respect to physics and uh, and the n plus is uh, the ah sorry yes yes minus is correct and and then the plus is one minus identity minus n minus Now, what, are the, what can we learn from this list of products? We can learn this very interesting generalization of the Fermi commutation relation. You see, this is what I, I mentioned. The Fermi commutation relation is only the first of this formula. But in the asymmetric case, it's very important that we have this. And as you see, in the asymmetric case, you, what comes out here is exactly the, diff, the, well, here is the sum, but typically it will be zero when you have a, a completely asymmetric case. A completely, sorry, symmetric case. You, re, if you remember, the symmetric case was characterized by the fact that MP equal to MP tilde is equal to zero. In fact, A, A zero is identically equal to zero. So this commutation relation. So this shows why, in my opinion, this was not caught by physicists. Because the physicists went down empirically, but we are going down deductively. So the physicists missed this commutation relation. But the preservation operator plays an important role. And so what we can say is that the standard theory of Fermi anti-commutation covers only the symmetric Bernoulli measures, but not the asymmetric ones. And of course, we have then the, this commutation relation for the adjoint, but this, this is not fundamental. It is interesting that we have also the, the Lie algebra, because we have the product separately, as I told you. The Lie algebra is S, is SO3. And this is, of course, well known. So you have the two structures. One is the anti commutator, which gives Fermi. And commutator gives SO3 Lie algebra. But, as usual, there is the A0 commutation relation. As you see, this is very clear why it is a measure of asymmetry. It is zero is if either the values are symmetric or the probability is symmetric. So a little bit less than, than a full symmet symmetry of the Bernoulli measure is required for having a zero this, commu uh, this commutation relation. For the anti-commutation relation, is not true. But for the commutation relation is true. Incidentally, in the boson case, as you know, and this is well, very well explained in the Bartasarati book, these are the generators of the Euclidean group, the multidimensional version of this. These are only of the translations and the, the generalized translation. But this is the fully Euclidean group, including rotations and unitary transformations. Okay, now the proof is uh, elementary. And this relation is important for the uh, deeper understanding of uh, 
these are indices of symmetries. Uh, in, an index in economy is a, is a some single number which describes a more complex uh, situation. Many parameters. You synthesize the information into a number. Of course, it, it gives less information than the individual parameters. Now, I want to put the... I want to use the normalized form uh, because it gives a uh, possibility to do some calculation and to understand something better. Uh, what is the normalized? I want to put the, the random variable x in, uh, in a matrix form, not with respect to the monic basis, but to the normalized basis. So there is only one vector difference. You see? What is the advantage? Well, you do some uh, elementary computation. The advantage is that in this way, you have a, a very uh, clear and ap apparent uh, symmetry of the multiplication operator. It is a symmetric matrix, okay, as, you, as you want. Pay attention that here, if you take a complex square root, you can take a complex square root. Uh, then, of course, you have to put a joint. In this normalized form, you do calculation for the, for the products, how they act on single vectors, and uh, you uh, uh, express the commutation relation. So, let me make the bridge with the standard physics. In standard physics, you know there are the Fermi, in the Fermi case, there are the Pauli matrices, the sigma plus and sigma minus. They, of course, generate a two-dimensional subspace of the matrices, linearly generate. And if you, if you uh, take the algebraic, that is, you allow products, then by multiplying sigma plus, sigma minus, you get n plus, sigma minus, sigma plus, you get n minus, and you get a full basis. Okay, of the matrices. So this is a linear basis of the 2 by 2 matrices. But we have, this is, okay. However, we have seen that in the canonical form for Bernoulli random variable, uh, uh, the, it is not sigma 3 appearing, but this deformation of sigma 3, which is sigma 3 Q, and sigma 3 Q is expressed in terms of a Q anti-commutator of the um, sigma plus and sigma minus. So in this sense, we can speak of Q deformation of the anti-commutator, anti-commutation uh, anti relation. If you allow a complex Q, I did the calculation for complex Q, I want to discuss this. Is, this is an interesting open problem. I want to discuss it at the end. But you can, the, 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 the computations, you can always do with complex Q. And you see why the Q deformation arises. Because sigma plus Sigma 3 gives the Q. Probably the people who does qu do quantum group know this very well. It's a very standard example of, of, uh, of Q, Q deformation. But again, this was put by hand. In this case, uh, what I think is an advantage is that we deduce this, this uh, uh, kind of relations from classical probability. And then, of course, this is a standard uh, because these are the spectral projections of this operator. This is, if Q is complex, is normal. If Q is real, is self-adjoint. So this comes, let me come to the last topic I want to, I promise to discuss the meaning. Okay, this is uh, just a remark.
the important point is that this is, this is a generalization, this is very well known when Q is equal to 1. But this is a generalization which is needed if you want to do, for example, central limit theorems. This, I will not do the calculation with you, sir. Simple. What is important is the meaning. For me, this is the most important thing. What is the meaning of Q? So let us do some examples to get a feeling of this meaning. Okay, we we are now taking that M tilde the uh, uh, the um, reflected mean is different from zero. This means that the probability is uh, different from the fair probability for the bet x plus x minus p. And so, what we measure here, you see, is, is this object is extremely int interesting from the probability point of view. Because, well, let me, let me, mm, arrive to this. I have written, so I will arrive to this. But you can, antici I can anticipate uh, the result. You see, this is the probability which makes the bet fair. In economics called no arbitrage probability. And there exists a unique one. So you see that the Q parameter measures how this is different. Remember, this can be either positive or negative. So either the numerator or the denominator is a measure of difference from the fair probability. Seventy-four, remember, means that the mean, the flipped mean, is non-zero, and uh, this is. Uh, we want that they are both non-zero, so it corresponds to the case three in the canonical form. So, this is the the fair probability, and you express Q. Just a moment. So P zero X is the arbitrage or fair. Pro okay. So this is the final result. The Q parameter is an index that measures how far. In the remember, we are now in the. Uh, m tilde equal to z uh, different from zero. It measures how far the real random variable is from the fair random variable, which makes the bet fair. And the mean zero excludes this possibility. So this denominator is always different from zero. So, in the case of free probability, will correspond to the case in which the Bernoulli random variable is fair. The case of Bose probability will correspond, we have already seen when we studied the necessary condition, to the symmetric probability. It doesn't mean fair, because symmetric probability is fair only if x, x, uh, x minus is equal to minus x plus. That is, uh, I lose, what I lose is equal to, in absolute value, to what I, I, I gain in the bet. And the Fermi case, q equal minus 1, corresponds to the fact that the fair probability is equal to one half, which is equivalent to say that what I said before, 
x plus is minus x minus, or conversely. Okay? So this is, for me, what is the added value of the orthogonal polynomial approach. First of all, that you get new commutation relations for Fermi and the anti-commutation relation, which are not considered in physics literature. Second, that you get the, a physical and probabilistic interpretation of the Q deformation parameter. Why the Q deformation parameter? Well, how will we enter? Let me just br very briefly. Ah, OK, no, I did not put. OK. What, what is the open problem I wanted to mention before concluding? The open problem is the following. I have always discussed the Q real because I have taken real valued random variables. But if you do a very, very simple uh, reflection, you see that uh, the gram schmidt orthogonalization procedure can also be applied to complex valued random variables. OK? And so all the construction that I did of the orthogonal polynomial for the Bernoulli random variable can be applied to the case of complex variant random variable. Okay? I don't know. This would be an interesting point. It may be easy. May, may be, maybe there is uh, some conceptual problem behind. I don't know if the procedure that I described you in my talk yesterday is applied to complex valued random variables. Of course, the orthogonalization is the, the, the some, a great part of what I said is automatic. The, the, the gradation will be done and so on. There may be some subtle difference about positivity. Because for complex random variable, what is the variance? You have to define the variance. The natural, the natural complex variance would be not the square, but the modulus square. Okay? And so on. So you have to take care of something. My point is, suppose that you do, and you can uh, repeat the uh, approach that I described you yesterday to complex variable. Then you apply to Bernoulli random variable. Then you now obtain a complex Q, because the mean value will be complex. Remember that the Q parameter is the quotient between the mean and the flipped mean. So the flipped mean and the mean. Okay? So you will obtain a complex variable. So this would indicate that an arbitrary complex number can come as a deformation parameter. Okay? And this I leave as an open problem. Thank you. We can go for tea. It's time. <laughs>